This has been Top Dog ever since the teaser for Godzilla King of the Monsters, and cemented its position against challengers with a showcase in Everything Everywhere All at Once. Said film could have been the shark-jumping moment where the song was irretrievably lost to irony, given directors Quan and Scheinert's style mercilessly marries the aesthetics of prestige and shitpost. Yes, despite its silliness, Everything Everywhere All at Once is achingly sincere. But could the general public be trusted to recognize that? But then it won Best Picture, so apparently yes. Beautiful. Delicate. To score a film or video with Claire de Lune signals a desire to be seen not only as an intellectual, but as an aesthete. The song could lose potency if the Claire de Lune sequence from Everything Everywhere All at Once were parodied, but... How would you even? I fear we must, as a society, and as a community of video essayists, move on from Gymnopédie No. 1. It held the title longer than I think any champion previous, and for that it deserves merit. But its time is over. It is, like the phrase, mad dated. Mad dated. This is saying la mau out loud. Did you know that the original screenplay for the 2005 film The Island specifically stated that in the weird culty enclave in which the film opens, Gymnopédie No. 1 must be playing over the loudspeaker? I don't think Michael Bay followed that directive. I'm not re-watching the movie to find out, but that is how long this was the smart music song since five months after YouTube launched. If you must, absolutely must, put Sati in a video essay, use No Cien number one, though it too is on its way to passe. At this point, I'm prepared to say vexations or GTFO. Nothing was certain after Sati vacated the throne. For a while it seemed we might have a Starks versus Baratheon situation between Schubert and Debussy. Following several appearances in pretentious YouTube videos, the Ave Maria made its strongest showing yet by scoring the opening scene in the grim darkest Batman film so far. An entire 20 days before getting fully Lannistered by everything everywhere all at once and Claire de Lune. Unbowed, unbent, and unbroken, still she nips at the heels of the king and may yet take his place. No one else poses a comparable threat. Hers is a curious strategy, being a religious Christmas and even classic Disney standard now repurposed as smart music. She gets a big boost every December, but can she take the top spot before this cyclical exposure nudges her back into a prior niche? Time will tell. If you were in a film program in the mid-2000s, you are sick to death of Moonlight Sonata. Also, if you were in a music class where you were asked to determine a song's time signature by ear, how am I supposed to tell the difference between waltz time and 4-4 with all triplets without the sheet music in front of me? To say scoring a video with Moonlight Sonata is a hack move, I... You'd have to be a hack to not already know. This was the soundtrack to the Blind Cave Salamander level in Earthworm Jim 2. There's no coming back from that. I mean, the association with Tallarico Studios alone. It's done. Roll over Beethoven.
this one is firmly rooted. It's not going anywhere. Both in the sense that nothing could soon push it off the list, but also... It's hard to imagine it rising any higher. It is just slightly too beautiful. Slightly too expressive. Slightly too... Legato to fall into the stiffness of Abanera or the pomposity of a De Beers ad, but just close enough in tone to them to always read as a hipper alternative. So you'll never be overexposed, but you'll never go that long without hearing the Yo Yo Ma version. And so here it stays, third on the podium. Solid bronze, the waterbender, the plop. With you, as always, is Prelude to Cello Suite Number no. One. And I am frankly surprised it took us this long to get to Johan, but worry not, he'll be Bach. <laughs> It's not that she isn't a beautiful piece of music, and it's not that she already had her time. In truth, she never got her flowers. Inasmuch as she had a run, it was squished in between the omnipresences of Beethoven and Satie. You'll still hear from her now and then. She crops up like a lucky penny. And you'll smile every time. But you know the stars in your eyes are not those of present joy. They are the stars of nostalgia. A fondness for what was and what could have been. What should have been. Why? Why couldn't this have had the legs of Gymnopédie? I mean, even the fucking Champs version. C could that have made a run? Could TikTok pick this up? But comes the day you have to accept, if it was gonna happen, it would have happened by now. Air on the G-string grows weary. Let her rest. Bit of a dark horse, this one. It didn't exactly come out of nowhere, and it's been here the whole time. But <laughs> you didn't see it coming. It's like that time I went snorkeling, and I wondered, where are all the fish? I was told there would be tropical fish, but all I see is blue. But then I caught one flitting by my head, and just as soon as my eyes registered the shape, I realized they were everywhere. I just hadn't taken them in. This is the one that makes you ask, where did I hear that before? Was this the one at the end of Margaret? No. How did it go? How do I hum a dyad? But then it shows up again, and oh yeah, that one, the really pretty one. I knew it'd come around again. Has staying power. Could make a run for the top if it sees an opening, but seemingly content for now to just dance around the periphery, appreciated when heard, if only half remembered the next day. The bottom end of acceptability. Anything lower you must avoid. But you can use Prelude in E. It's a risk, and it takes skill. 
but you can use Prelude in E. It is not for the faint of heart. This is the ending of Fez we're talking about here. This is that one TED talk about how everyone loves classical music, they just don't know it yet. This was all over Anatomy of a Fall. Are, are you sure you wouldn't prefer something lighter? Nocturne in E flat is very nice. Prelude has just enough penetration that some people are going to recognize it, and enough clout that those who do are going to expect things of the person who puts it in a video essay. You can't just throw this under a rant about the Snyder Cut. But you can, with care, with effort, and with grace, you can use Prelude in E. We are not ready for Spiegel im Spiegel. The rare smart music that is rather than classical contemporary minimalist. This is, I have been led to believe, all over the film festival circuit. It is the go-to for aspiring art house directors, so I assume it's only a matter of time until it reaches general cultural awareness and through that, the YouTube video essay. But we, as the YouTube video essay community, are not, at this point in time, pretentious enough to pull off Spiegel im Spiegel. That's not a statement on the song itself. It is a lovely, sparse, unpretentious piece of music, which is why pretentious people are drawn to it. And we're not there yet. But I believe in us. The list of songs that represent smart music is not ranked by quality. They are all, as a baseline, masterpieces. They are ordered, instead, by their possession of antipodal qualities. Beethoven's Fifth may be a beautiful piece of music, but it's too well known. To the casual listener, it reads only as classical music. Voltava is a beautiful piece, but it's not recognizable enough. To most, it will read only as music. Pachelbel's canon works in too many contexts. Mozart's Lacrimosa no longer works in any context, but shit's about to go off. The song that represents smart music must balance these humors. Suggestive, but not too specific. Recognizable, without being over-familiar. The kind of thing one imagines cultured people listen to, and fancies oneself cultured for having noticed it. Just popular enough to signify obscurity to a large number of people. This impossibility of being both popular and obscure is what keeps the list in motion. Many songs drift back into obscurity before reaching the top, but once the primary position is achieved, a song begins its slow procession to overexposure. And when at last it is too popular to be niche, it does not slip to number two. It plummets to the bottom as did Icarus. Due to this slow but constant movement, new songs will, at intervals, join the ranks, taking the place of those that have become gauche. And if, dear listener, you were aiming to trendset, to score your next whatever it is you do with the newest song to represent smart music, and were I a gambling man? Box Prelude in C.
and I'll tell you why. It appears in the Netflix series Bodies alongside Chopin, mirroring Satie's dual appearance in The Queen's Gambit. Its arpeggiated structure makes it usable in scenarios similar to the cello suite, Johann did love him some broken chords. And it forms the basis of the Gounod version of Ave Maria, if you would like a cool person's alternative to Schubert. You may feel I'm playing things a bit too safe, but I tell you truly, this song is due. But if I can impart one piece of wisdom, let it be this. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, you cannot use for Eliza. You cannot. You can't do it. It can't be allowed. Don't fuck. Hey, couple questions for you. One, do you like banger video essays? Uh, if you're watching this, I assume you do. And two, do you like movies where people bang? If yes, then have I got the series for you. Broey Deschanel's Taboo on Screen, a Nebula original series that I have been mainlining this week. Broey is a YouTuber I discovered when I was searching for a good video essay on neo-noir and came across her video comparing Thief and Drive. And from there, her video on homoeroticism in Point Break, at which point I screamed at the algorithm for having never recommended her. Well, Nebula recognizes talent and not only scooped her up, but has funded and produced this Nebula original series that is fascinating, vital, and way too spicy for YouTube. I, I'm probably going to have to blur the preview, aren't I? If you liked my videos on uh, Guillermo del Toro or The Handmaiden, I think you would dig this. Definitely start right at the beginning with the should sex scenes even exist discourse. But Ian, what is Nebula and can I afford it? Well, buddy, Nebula is a streaming platform run by creators that I and Broey and a bunch of other cool folks have been using for a few years now. It is a curated collection of high-quality, ad-free work where your subscription goes directly into the pockets of the people doing the labor. Giving creators a space to make things more ambitious and more polished that we could neither afford nor host on YouTube, that's what Nebula does. Original prestige work uh, like Jesse Gender's short science fiction film Identities, coming out uh, depending on when this uploads, maybe today? Joining Nebula has made a lot of things possible for me, and I have really enjoyed working with them these past few years. I've never actually seen a streaming platform pull off what they're doing. And if you were to follow my link in the down there part, you would get 40% off an annual subscription, which comes to $2.50 a month. Now, if I were doing Taboo on film, then this video could have been list of songs that represent f***ing. Number one would be Ravel's Bolero, thanks almost exclusively to Bo Derek, uh, Tchaikovsky's love theme from Romeo and Juliet. It goes without saying. Good old Rachmaninoff, the second piano concerto, never mind.